All right, it is snowing. So we're gonna see how this goes. It might not be the best. I don't think it's windy. If it's windy, then the video doesn't work out too well. But if it's just snowing, I think that will be okay. So I wanna talk about sensory motor. I wanna talk about my journey and I wanna talk about all the mistakes I made on the journey to recovery, which I've been recovered from sensory motor for quite a long time. But I had a really bad, um, <laughs> I had a really bad stint with it. You know, my OCD went from tinnitus fears, tinnitus fears and sleep related fears to sensory motor based, but it's the same thing. It's all the same thing. Any sensation, any sleep sensation, any insomnia sensation, sensation from tiredness, any ear ringing, any breathing, blinking, swallowing saliva, your heartbeat, the big five, any hyper awareness of sensations inside of your body, such as, um, let's see, what are the big ones? Uh, pelvic floor, bladder flunk function, uh, pain related with health OCD is mixed in there. All of those, all based off the same principles, which is fear, fear, and the fear of it ruining your life for the remainder of your life. And I'm gonna talk all about that and how I was in the mental hospital. So before I go any further, please subscribe, hit that like button down below. You will see the direct message from Phil right away. So we can get you in uh, pronto. Like I say, we work with all different time zones. I'll let you know more about the conference coming up that we're holding. We've never run one before, so we don't know how we're gonna do it. But we will be doing it. We just don't know the exact uh, thing behind it yet. And 8.30 p.m. UK times, we have all of the webinars, which are a lot of fun. Questions and answers section, just a lot of people together. You know, they can get to 50, 70 people. And as they grow, we'll probably switch platforms um, to probably Zoom because it can handle more people at once, which is uh, probably coming here in the next year or so with how, how fast they grow and the interaction. And people love them, right? And uh, sometimes I, the webinars, can, the energy can just be so good. And it's also cool to be around a bunch of different sufferers. Okay, so uh, what do we know about sensory motor? Uh, number one, sensory motor OCD is more than likely one of the most misunderstood. Doesn't make it any more difficult to recover. OCD is OCD, but because so many people misconstrue exposures as the primary factor with OCD recovery, if they're coming from an ERP perspective, where it matters much more from contamination, OCD, et cetera, et cetera. But overall, it's very misunderstood. <laughs> And because people are coming with exposures, I'll give you an example. I work with people that come from all different centers around the world. Hey, I have breathing OCD. I'm hyper aware of my breathing. I'm manually breathing all day long. They're making me breathe through a straw. They're making me do all this stuff. It's such a whiteout right now. This is awesome. Um, only I would think it's awesome. Or anyone that likes being outside in the cold. And uh, it's not working. And I say, well, there's really no need to ever really expose yourself to your breathing because... You're gonna breathe every day for the rest of your life anyway. Same thing with swallowing, saliva, blinking. You have to get used to noticing those sensations when they come up. Well, am I breathing properly? How do I know if I'm doing this properly? Looking for those answers. So exposures matter very, very minuscule to not even relevant at all when it comes to sensory motor. Now, if you've never had sensory motor OCD, you might have heard stuff such as, you know, you'll hear people say, oh, I thought about my blinking for three minutes and gave myself sensory motor. That's a massive disservice to an OCD sufferer. That's like me going into an AIDS clinic and looking at an AIDS patient and saying, oh, I imagined having AIDS for three minutes and I have AIDS. It's a very, very... um it's a dangerous statement to say because it undermines what happens. We don't have to hold that against anyone, but just because people will, will hear that and they'll say, oh, I heard this in the podcast and it made me feel so hopeless because I feel like I couldn't snap out of it like this person was. Very similar. It's like me saying, um, you know, oh, I read a history book and I know what it's like to be in World War II. I have no clue what it's like to be in World War II and I wouldn't want to be there. <laughs> I wouldn't want to see my friends get killed or, you know, if, if until I got killed, which is high probability if I was going on D-Day or some of these other battles, uh, etc. So um, we just have to be careful with stuff like that. But we can forgive those people, obviously, for making those statements because many of them are trying their best. Anyway, so exposures matter very, very little, like I said. The second thing that matters the most is your avoidance behaviors surrounding your sensation. So a great one would be the individual uh, has breathing OCD or blinking, right? So they have blinking OCD, they're hyper aware of their blinking, they have dry eye sensations, and they're thinking, oh my gosh, not only am I noticing my blinking, I'm looking at other people and noticing their blinking, which then brings me away from the present moment. Oh my gosh, how do I get back to the present moment? This is so terrible, etc. Well, it's because you're viewing it being terrible is what's driving it. And because of your perspective on not being present, 
Uh, if you know what being waterboarded is, it was a torture technique that the CIA, CIA, CIA used. Um, and not to, in a political sense, just to tell you what it is, where they kind of like would hold you in this position and drip water on your head or pour water in your mouth, um, et cetera. And it would kind of mimic drowning sensations. I don't, I mean, I know what it is, but not much about it. But that's how it, how it feels, I'd have to imagine, because it, it's like an internal sensation that you can't run from that's with you every second of the day. Now, Every OCD sufferer feels like that, but because sensations are part of your being, okay, thoughts are part of your being, urges are, but they're not constant. You can have severe POCD if you're on the couch and not in a complete spike with some humming background guilt, um, which makes it, I'm not comparing, I'm just giving you an example why people with sensory motor think it's so difficult to recover. But I've had many themes that aren't based around sensory motor, and um, I got past those too by changing my belief system, which is, again, the most primary uh, factor of all of it. So, again, you have to bring down all of your avoidance behaviors based around your sensations, which, which takes time. It really does take a lot of time to get yourself to a place where you're completely okay with noticing your sensations and or noticing other people's sensations. Now, mind you, this is 100% how you get over any fear of pain. Now, let's say you have a disc herniation. Yes, there might be a structural problem, but the pain is a sensation. Whether the pain is there or not, your perspective on the pain, it drives a large factor of your overall experience with the pain. So I see this every day, you know, being in healthcare, you see people where they're like, uh, you know, I have this pain and it's so terrible. There's a massive difference between an 80 year old, two 80 year olds, one who has osteoarthritis, which is um, just, you know, regular arthritis in both their knees. And one of them use it as, you know, annoying, but works around it and still goes to the gym and still goes outside versus the person that's, that has the most detrimental, catastrophic uh, end of the world perspective on that. And then that really, really causes an extra pain experience. But the belief has to be worked on. We don't have to do anything like somato tracking or anything like that. I see a lot of stuff online about tracking your sensations and stuff. None of that's necessary. It could be a really big slippery slope for OCD and anxiety sufferers. It's understandable why people do it, but it's not needed. What's needed is decreasing avoidance behaviors, time and patience, getting more comfortable with your sensations, and slowly chipping away at it over time. Uh, and we all want something easier. By the way, I realize I'm probably not gonna be able to make this as long as the video as I want because my phone's already getting cold. And I just realized that my phone will shut off after 16 minutes of doing a great video. This has happened to me when I was hiking. It's why I don't make videos hiking up there anymore. So I was, let's just speed up. So obviously I was in the mental hospital and everyone really tried to help me very well intentioned meaning individuals, different psychologists, psychiatrists, different centers. But unfortunately they all pointed me in the wrong direction. Met Rob. Rob's first call, he's like, Mr. Panella, you're scared, you're scared because you're noticing your sensations forever. As yes, that's my accent. And I'm like, oh fuck, that's it. You know, and it clicked. Now it didn't click right away in the sense of I got better. It took me a couple of years, but it made sense on why I was still struggling or why I was super struggling, plus all the video games and the smoking. So all that had to go, okay? Someone asked me the other day, which I don't answer these questions because it's usually reassurance and they're looking for when they're going to feel better. But it took me a couple of years, two, three years to really accept the presence of my sensations and really become comfortable with the possibilities of them coming back. I needed big relapses after long periods of time feeling better. That way I became more comfortable with it coming back. So that was a big one as well. And that needed to happen because when you're feeling good is when you think you're on top of the world. Then it comes back and smash you in the face like Mike Tyson. And you're like, oh shit, I'm noticing my blinking again. Be prepared for the symptoms to switch around. Blinking, breathing, swallowing, saliva. Some people don't, some people do. Some people have many at the same time, some people don't. It, none of that matters. It's always looking for a way to get you to analyze and get you back into the cycle. What matters is your belief system on your sensations. Ringing of the ears, tinnitus, same principles. The fear of it ruining your life. What if I have ear damage? What if I lose my hearing, etc. Breathing, what if I have to manually breathe? for the remainder of my life, et cetera, et cetera, all those things. So getting comfortable with those sensations and breaking them down is the key. First book on the reading list, Stubbornly Refuse. Get that book if you haven't read it already. Start, start um, plugging and chugging your belief systems based around your sensations, how you view them, why you think they're terrible, everything else in between. That will be a massive thing, very, very important. Uh, and then you go from there, but don't, don't forget about those subtle avoidance behaviors.
I'm going to sleep in a little bit and this and that. We're not saying you can't sleep in ever. We're saying that most of you are doing it pretty frequently. And then uh, we'll go from there. And then you guys that need help, uh, I, I say, I'm, uh, I mean, I don't think there's anyone on the planet that works with more sensory motor shuffers than Rob and me, um, which because of our experiences. Remember, Rob taught me everything I know. Rob's the reason uh, I know I figured out how to recover because of um, Rob's teachings that came from Ellis. So obviously Ellis is extremely important, but we get it. You know, we understand. We've been there. I've lived that locked in internal swallowing saliva, blinking, breathing, heartbeat, anxiety sensations, panic sensations. So I hope you guys enjoy. I'll do another quick one on the street. My hands are freezing, um, but I can't wait to go hiking uh, sometime. Hopefully there's a lot of snow here still on Sunday, which I think there will be because I'm going to disappear into the abyss, which is my favorite thing to do. Um, always a pleasure, everyone. Look for the WhatsApp link down below and then we'll go from there. Have a good one.